So for the first part, we will uh, put an emphasis on determining the focal length of a few lenses. And we have a range here. These lenses will be labeled 1, 2, and 3. And they have varying focal lengths relative to each other. One has a relatively long focal length, one has a relatively short focal length, and one is somewhere in between. But we, we, wanted, we wanted to determine the focal lengths of these lenses by utilizing the optical bench that has a luminous source object. It's a little bit difficult to see, but this has a number four, and when we turn it on, it's going to, it's going to look like a number four. But because of the aperture right now on the camera, it's probably going to be too much. It probably looks like a, a blob of light. Is that the case? Yeah. So we'll use this as our object, and we'll be using um, a trans, uh, translucent screen. So you can see the images on both sides of this. And by putting them on the optical bench, we'll be able to use the metric ruler that is on the bench to determine the relative positions of the object to the lens and the screen to the lens. Because that's really what we're going to be referring to as these distances. They're always going to be relative to the lens. So in this case, I'll have a short image distance and a large object distance or a short object distance and a larger uh, image distance. So we're able to move these and position them to try to get an image that forms on the screen. And that'll be important because, as you'll see, for the first part in this procedure, we're going to manipulate the lens, the screen, and or the object to try to get an image to form on the screen with each of these lenses. And we'll use the data that we collect for the object distance and the image distance in each case to calculate a value for the focal length, again, using the thin lens equation. So we can get started. Uh, I'll start with lens one. And I'm going to put it here on the bench. We'll dim the lights. And I'll turn on my luminous object. And we can get in a position to see what this screen looks like, too, if you'd like. And we'll zoom in on it. So you'll note that on the screen, we get some semblance of that number four that is our luminous object. And we'll note that this is, it appears that this number four is, is it's not in focus, it's a little fuzzy. It is inverted. And I can tell you that the image appears slightly smaller in size than the object that is being broadcast. So I'm going to have to manipulate the, either the object or the lens or the screen. It turns out it doesn't matter because we're going to end up getting an image to form. And, and what we'll want to do is we'll just want to note what the relative distances are for the object and the image. So as you can see, as I move the lens closer or further back, this image on the screen comes into and out of focus. And it's going to be my judgment to where that needs to be in order to get an image. And I think that this is a good position. I go a little bit further, it starts to get fuzzy. I go back, it's crisp. I go back even further, it's fuzzy again. And so somewhere right in there, I'm getting an image to focus and project onto the screen. It's a real image. It's broadcast onto a screen. We have light that's actually converging to this point. But this is not the focal point of the lens. It's, it, so it's, an, it's involved. The focal length is involved, but we don't quite yet know what it is until we make a calculation for these, these distances, the object distance and the image distance. So we'll turn the lights on. And then we'll, uh, we'll come and take a look at the relative positions of the lens and the object. So with the object located at the 20 centimeter position and the lens located at the... What do we have there? 78.2, 78 point. 78 so about the 78.2 position, the difference between these positions is going to be 58.2 centimeters. And on the other side, the difference between the screen and the lens is going to be, What's the yeah, so we're looking at no, 30.2, 30.2, 30.3 uh, centimeters is the distance between the lens and the screen. So we have about I'm doing the math right in my head, about 30 centimeters between these two and about 50 centimeters between these two. And we'll mark those values in our lab notebook. All right, so that's the first focal length. We have our data. That's the first lens, rather, to determine the focal length using the thin lens equation. We'll now use the second lens to try to get it into focus.
So we have been able to determine, we measure the values for both the object distance and the image distance for three different lenses. And um, with those values, we can now apply the thin lens equation and determine the focal length, solving for that, uh, for that unknown focal length value for each of those lenses. And we'll record that in our lab notebooks. For the second part in part one, what it wants us to do, you'll notice that if you take a look in your lab manuals, that the thin lens equation implies that there are actually two locations for an image to form when you have the object and the screen in, uh, in a fixed position. This isn't often clear to students, but it should kind of make sense that if one over the object distance plus one over the image distance is equal to one over the focal length, then if it works for, say, one over three centimeters plus one over five centimeters, that should give you the same as if you had one over five centimeters plus one over three centimeters. In other words, you can get an image to form on the screen with the lens at two different positions for, for this setup. So as I have it here, there, there is an image to form on, on this screen, and it's probably not going to be able to be picked up by the, uh, by the camera, just by the low light conditions. Notice that at this location, I have a relatively small image distance for a relatively large object distance. Now, if I, if I kind of seesaw that, if I balance that on the other side, then I should be able to find an image when I have a relatively small object distance and a relatively large image distance. And sure enough, you'll see an image form on the screen. So to put this in perspective, we have an image here with our object, lens, and screen all the way down here. And we also get an image to form right there at about the same distance now that the object was away previously that we have the screen in this location. So two locations will give me an image, though there's obviously something that is substantially different about these. They're both inverted on the screen relative to the object itself, but there is a substantial size difference between what we have when the object distance is small compared to when the image distance is small. Okay, so that last part was using the physical distances between the object and the lens and the screen and the lens to apply the thin lens equation and calculate a value for the focal length. There's another way that we can also approximate the focal length, and it involves using objects that are relatively very far away. So I'm going to remove the object from our optical bench here, and I'm just going to leave the, uh, the lens and the screen. In fact, I believe um, I'll start with our first lens, lens one. And if you recall from last week, the light rays that are formed from objects that are rel relatively very far away, so very in quotes, very far away, approximately come in parallel. If they're far enough away from some source, by the time they reach all the way down here, they're coming in approximately parallel to each other. And so these light rays are coming in parallel, they're going to hit this converging lens, and they're going to refract and start to converge to a single point. Well, if you take a look at the thin lens equation, the portion of that equation that accounts for the object distance, one over the object distance, well that fraction starts to blow up in the denominator because the object distance is really far away. So what's one over one? It's one. What's one over ten? Point one. What's on one over hundred? Point zero one. As that denominator gets larger and larger and larger, that whole portion of the thin lens equation, one over the object distance, blows up in the denominator, like I said, and it kind of it almost vanishes, it goes away. One over something really large is very close to zero. And so what you're left with is one over the image distance is equal to one over the focal length, therefore the image distance is approximately equal to the focal length. So this is an approximation method. And we're going to use it to compare to the values that we calculated using the thin lens equation previously. So um, the good news about this is I just need to get something that's really far away into focus from out the window. I got blue sky, white cloud, green grass, and we're going to see if we can get an image here, but we'll need to lower the lights to see if we can get something to form here on the screen. Here we go. 
So I'm getting a really good image here. And again, I always test, you know, I go a little bit forward, it's fuzzy, I bring the screen backward, it's fuzzy again, and I want to get it so that I can get as, as many of those details nice and crisp in there. I'm getting a color image that is formed by a converging lens taking parallel light rays, closely parallel light rays, and converging them under the screen. This distance is a very special distance because it is very close to being the focal length. The light that comes in parallel to a converging lens, parallel light rays that come into a converging lens will always pass through the focal length. And so for light that's almost parallel, it's going to come pretty darn close to going through the focal length, which is approximately right here at this location. So I simply need to um, find the distance between these two, and I'll record that distance. So I'm getting 58.7. And 78.4. Negative 19.7. And for my number two lens, in order to get this into focus, I note that I have to come a little bit closer to get that image to form. And yet it seems a little more intense. Sixty eight point four, seventy eight point four. Yikes. So for my third converging lens. The focal length is so relatively short that we can't quite get an image of what it looks like from the front side. But, like I said, this is a translucent screen, so you should be able to see when that image forms. So, I get 73.1 and 78.4. In your lab manual, in your lab report rather, you're going to um, edit an image of a relatively far object from the, from the lens and you'll edit that image to show how parallel light comes in, hits a converging lens, and then forms an image on the screen. And so hopefully you can relate what, you, what you've seen just now to what you'll be doing there to kind of get an idea of how it is that we use this approximation method to determine the focal length for a converging lens. So in part two, we're going to attempt to model a camera using our medium focal length lens, uh, either our number one or our number two, as it says in the lab manual. And we're going to, again, focus on a very distant object that's out the window. And this will effectively be a model of a camera with the screen representing the photographic film. We're going to... Um, so we've removed the light source in this case, and we're going to allow the light from the open window to reach our lens. So I think it's fine to use lens number one. And with the screen held stationary, we're going to move the lens a distance from the screen that is greater than its focal length. So for lens one, we were getting a focal length of about 20 centimeters. So we're going to move it at a distance that is, that is beyond its focal length. And so as we do that, there's, there's different features of the room that will come into focus. So say, for example, if I stick my hand out, if I were to, my hand, which is now closer to my lens, comes into focus, whereas those objects in the background are now no longer in focus. So as I move this further up, I'm able to focus on closer objects as I get further away from my focal length. And those objects that are far out in the distance, they no longer come into focus. And if you if you recall, that should make sense because only objects that are far away will come into focus when we're at approximately the focal point. So moving this lens further away from the screen will allow closer objects to come into focus while leaving the ones in the background out of focus. So what we're going to do is we're going to, we're going to place our hand between the objects that are outside of the window and the lens and 
we're going to uh, use our hand as an object that's closer for us to focus on. And we're going to use the silhouette of my hand on the screen to, to try to bring that into focus. And so notice as I get, as the object is closer, I'll move my lens further away from the screen to try to bring it into focus. If the object is further away, then I'll have to move this back to try to get that silhouette into focus. By the way, you may be asking why it is that I'm able to get a nice clear color image of the uh, picture outside the window on my screen and yet I'm only getting a silhouette in my hand. Well, you should think about where this light that we're using to form this, these images are coming from. They're coming from outside the window and so there's no light left to bounce off the palm of my hand which is facing this lens and so we'll only get that silhouette. So with my, with my hand in focus here on the screen, I'm now going to try to take it out of focus and again focus on those objects that are in the background. So the things that are happening outside in the window, that blue sky and those, and those puffy clouds. But you'll notice that moving this along the, the rail is causing those further objects to come into, into focus when the lens is closer to the screen and those closer objects to come into focus when the lens is further away from the screen. And this is really what's going on with a, with a camera who has an active focus that's either focusing on closer objects or focusing on objects that are further away in the background. All right, so in part three, if you, if you read through this, we're now discussing the magnification of an image. And as you saw earlier in part one, we can change the size of the image that is formed from the object passing through a converging lens. So it'll be important for you to note how the geometry is involved with uh, arriving at the equation for the magnification of an image. But we'll get right to the uh, experimental portion of this. As you'll see in number five, it wants you to use a single lens with a medium focal length. So we'll grab lens number two. And the light source on the rail. So this time we're actually gonna, we're gonna go back to using this light source. So really we're just gonna, we're gonna move this guy in three different places and we're gonna to try to get an image in each case. We'll try to get a small one, a large one, and maybe one that's about the same size. And so we're just gonna note what we get here. So for the first one, there, we have an image. And I'm gonna note these locations. I think we're... and then the height of the object itself. And now to measure the image height. Looks like it's 1.6. So in part four, we're actually going to use the same equipment to attempt and model the uh, human eye as a, as a lens screen system. So as you'll note in your lab manual, it wants you to place the lens with the longest focal length. In this case, it'll be lens one in the holder uh, in position and position the screen so that very distant objects will, will come into view. So if we put this guy here and we can change our screen so this shows up well? Very good. Okay. To try to get very distant objects to come into view. And this setup here represents the model of the human eye when it's at rest. And the, uh, that is when the eye is focused on the horizon. In a real eye, the lens is actually located behind the cornea. And I have a, a little model here to, to try to show you what I mean by that. So if we take away the layers of the eye, and if we 
Notice that the, there's the, the cornea right here in the eye is actually the boundary where most of the refraction of light occurs. It's this lens in its location right behind the cornea that allows there to be some, for some more fine adjustments. So I want you to realize that in this model, the lens does not change as it doesn't change in real life. The position of the lens does not change. And so we're going to attempt to, to, to maintain this lens position for our model of the, of the human eye in this setup as it is with a real eye. So we've got distant objects in focus here on our retina on the screen. And this represents the eye when it's at rest. You'll notice in your lab manual, it says it wants you to now return the light source. So we're going to use this light source to focus on a, on a closer object. And you'll note that no matter where I have this, I'm unable to, to focus this light on the screen. The lens of my eye it has not adjusted its shape to, uh, to change its focal length and allow closer objects to come into focus on the retina. So I'm going to model a, a change in shape of my lens by replacing it with my shortest focal length, number three. And you'll note now that I am able to bring closer objects into focus on the screen. And we kind of saw that this was very similar to what we, we had with the camera model. And the human eye is very similar in, in its basic structure to the, the, the structure of a camera. So I'm not too surprised to see that we have some similarities between these two models. If the image that forms on this screen is a bit washed out, because there's a lot of light here, um, it's usually the result of extraneous light that's coming in through the lens and uh, on the screen. It's light that isn't necessarily used to form an image. And so in bright light situations, the pupil in the eye will actually constrict in order to limit the amount of light that's actually able to make its way into, into the eye and onto the retina. And we can simulate this constriction by using the aperture wheel that we have at our disposal. And you'll note in your lab report, it wants you to place the aperture wheel on the optic bench between the source and the lens. And that should make sense because that's where, you know, in the model of the eye, we actually have You'll note the, the pupil itself comes in front of the lens of the eye. So we'll mount this here and I'll start it on its largest aperture setting. Okay. And it really hasn't changed in terms of its, uh, of its brightness, but, uh, and actually what we'll do here is let's, uh, let's turn off that light. So what we've actually done is we've, uh, we've, we, we've, shuttered the windows here so that we can only have the, the, the light from, from the room, the ambient light from the room and that from the object here. And now you can really see that this image on the screen is relatively washed out. And so what we're going to do is we're going to step by step, we're going to limit the amount of light that comes through this aperture. And in doing so, we're going to model the constriction of the pupil. So as we go from our largest setting, letting the most light through, you can see it kind of get washed out around the four. And as we restrict that light greater and greater, we'll find that the image itself gets crisper and crisper. However, and that might have been our lowest set. We got one more here. And so we end up getting the image that is the sharpest image. But this still looks substantially different from what we had when our aperture was on the, on the largest setting. You'll note that while it may be sharper around the edges and we've eliminated that washed out light, that unnecessary light, light that doesn't go towards forming the image, the overall image itself appears to be significantly dimmer in comparison. And, and that should make sense. We're restricting the amount of light that's coming through here. And to try to show you what the setting is on this aperture wheel, it's, it's relatively very small, significantly smaller than the object itself. And so, You'll notice that we'll still be able to form an image on the screen, but it appears to be not nearly as bright as it was in the first case. In, and we're still getting those light rays that come from the top and the bottom of the image to pass through that little pinhole and then pass through the lens and converge on the screen in the background to show an image. So again, when we're on our largest setting, we'd still get an image that's bright, but a little washed out. But as we restrict, 
the amount of light that we're actually able to allow through that lens, we get a crisper image that's significantly dimmer. So continuing in part four, now moving on to um, really putting an emphasis on accommodation and the experiments that follow, we're again going to make sure we leave both the, the lens and the screen in fixed locations to try to simulate again the, uh, the lens of the eye and the retina. So these won't move in our model of the eye. And we're going to insert different lengths, uh, different focal lengths rather, different lenses with different focal lengths at the same location to try to focus on objects at, at varying distances. So the first thing we'll do, you'll see in part four, step seven, is to ensure that the light source is off and removed. And we've done that. We're allowing light from the window to reach our screen. And then we're going to simulate accommodation of the lens with our model eye by first placing the long focal length lens in this position and then we're going to switch to shorter and shorter focal length lenses. Again, I'm physically going to be removing one lens and putting another lens on, but in the human eye, or really almost nearly any eyeball it should be, uh, the, the, the lens itself is going to be the same. It's just going to change or accommodate its shape. And there is, uh, there's, a, there's a good discussion about this in the lab manual. If you follow through with this. It describes what's happening with the ciliary muscles that surround the lens that allow it to change its shape and focus on objects at different distances. So with our longest focal length lens here at this location, again, get a pretty crisp image of the outdoors. It's a bright day, blue sky, the outline of the trees. But if I have something that's closer, notice that it, it doesn't come into focus. In the camera, we were able to move the lens and change its position. We can't do that with the eye. And so what we're going to do with our eye that we can't do with the camera is we're going to change the shape of the lens. And, this, and to model that, we'll put this at the same location. And now as you see on the screen, I'm able to focus on the hand as I was able to with the camera, but for in a different way, using a different method to try to get this. I'm able to focus on a closer object. And now the background is what is blurry and out of focus. And for objects that are even closer, I can change the shape of my lens yet again. And so, and this one's a little more difficult to see, but if you, you, you can see as I move my hand in front of the, in front of the lens, the, the shape of my fingers and the web in between my fingers will show up on the screen as a crisp outline. And I'm much closer. Now, there comes a point where I can no longer focus on objects in front of my eye. It, no, regardless of what my eye does when it's in its most relaxed state or if it's at its, uh, if the muscles are their, at their greatest contraction, I'm not able to get these images into focus. I am past what is referred to as the near point of my eye. And you'll note that in your lab manual, it discusses the near point of the eye as the closest point in which you can focus clearly on an object. And it represents the maximum bulge that the lens can achieve. In young folks, this is usually a relatively close distance, somewhere around 10 centimeters. And that image will recede, that image distance rather that you can focus on, that distance will recede with age. It's, it's in general, it's a consequence of the eye's inability to continually change its shape as we age and get older. So the gradual loss of accommodation with age reflects the, the lens's changing elasticity, as it states in the lab manual. In many folks over 50, the lens is no longer accommodating a condition that's known as presbyopia. In other words, the lens can no longer make those small adjustment changes in its shape to, uh, to change the focus. And at that point, um, additional lens accommodation is, uh, is required. So the use of reading glasses might be more uh, effective at getting an image to focus up closer. So to measure the near point of our model eye, we're going to place the lens with the shortest focal length, which I already have here, lens number three. And we're going to use the light source now as the object. Measure the distance of the object from the eye's lens when it has reached the nearest point, the nearest point that we can get this thing to, uh, to come into focus. So this is lens three is the maximum bulge we're going to be able to achieve. And so as I move this closer and closer and closer, I get to a point where I am 
able to form an image on the screen, but past that point, it'll just be a blur. I won't be able to get that image to come into focus. And so the near point of my model eye here on the optical bench can be measured by finding the distance between the object and the lens. Now using a ruler or similar device, measure the near point of the eyes of your group members. So in this case, uh, for our first group member, to measure the near point, we're going to start with the paper far away from the face, so you can start with it out here. And the light will come over the shoulder, bounce off the page, make its way to its eye. And we're just going to measure, as best we can, the distance from the front of the cornea to the paper itself. And I'm getting a distance, if I take into account that part, it's about... 14 and a half centimeters. So that was where it could focus? 14 and a half centimeters. Okay. Huh. All right, so we'll do it for me now. So the final part of section four in this, in this lab experiment, which models the human eye, is going to take a closer look at the defects that are common with the human eye, namely, uh, hyperopia and myopia. So we'll focus on those two terms. Hyperopia or farsightedness is the condition where the eye has no problem seeing objects that are really far away, but it does have issue with focusing objects that are relatively up close. And this is a, a common condition for folks as they get older and the eye loses its ability to accommodate. They can still see perfectly fine away for objects that are um, that are out in the distance, that parallel light comes in and comes into focus uh, with relative ease on their retina. But for objects that are closer up, the eye can no longer accommodate as well. And so those objects don't come into focus. And so those objects will end up focusing too far behind the retina. So to model this, what we're going to do, to, we'll model the defect and then we'll model the correction of that defect. So to simulate the condition of hyperopia, you'll notice that it says in your lab manual to take the medium converging focal length lens and we're going to put this on the bench and we're going to move it so that we can get an image on the screen. And it's a clear image. But you'll note in your lab report it says uh, first bring the light from the source object into focus on the screen, then move the lens just a little bit closer to the screen. So we've got this object in focus, and now we're going to move it a little bit closer. And it asks you to think, what are you doing here? Regardless if this screen is here, that image is being formed somewhere. In fact, I can use my hand to kind of catch where that image is being formed. The actual image is being formed here, which is behind where my retina is. So this image is being formed too far behind the retina. What we need to do is shorten the overall focal length. Of that, of that light to have it to converge on the screen, in this case, modeling our retina. The next thing we're going to do is we're going to take a second converging lens, lens one, with the longest focal length, and we're going to put it between the light source and the primary lens, and we're going to manipulate the positions of the light source and the secondary lens to try to get an image to form on the screen. In fact, we, we kind of have good luck there. So again, this is the lens in our eye, this is our retina, and this is the corrective lens. It's a converging lens that converges light even further from what this primary lens is already converging. So without it, you'll see that image is no longer in focus, but with this secondary converging lens, it shortens that focal length. So the two lenses together act as a large refractory powered lens, and it shortens that focal length. So without and with, we're able to see the difference. We're shortening the focal length. Again, if we were able to accommodate or were able to move the lens, we could bring that image into focus on the retina, but this image is being formed too far behind the retina. And this converging lens shortens that focal length to bring the image into focus on the, on the screen. The second condition that we're going to model with our eye on the optical bench is the condition known as myopia. Myopic individuals have no problem focusing on objects that are relatively close. They still have the ability to accommodate with their lens, 
However, objects that are far out in the distance will no longer come into focus on the retina. Their eye, the lens in their eye is focusing light too far in front of the retina in their eye. So in your lab manual, it uh, suggests that you start again with the medium focal length lens and you'll bring that object into focus on the retina, on the screen. And once you've done that, you get a nice crisp image. This is what a normal functioning eye would, would do, would form an image at this location. But what happens is due to the, it's usually due to the shape of the eye itself, the image itself will now form too far in front of the retina. And so once again, we get a blurry image as we did with the hyperopic eye, but for a completely opposite reason. Instead of the light focusing too far behind the retina, now the light is focusing in front and I can get that image to kind of form on my finger. This is where it should be forming and yet my retina is all the way back here. So what do I need to do is I need to extend the focal length of the system by using now, for the first time in our experiment, we're gonna use the diverging lens. So that diverging lens will take this light that's coming in and it will kind of bow it out. Those light rays will diverge. They'll hit this converging lens and then they'll start to converge again. So it kind of adjusts that focal length. So here I have my myopic eye unable to cause an image to come into focus. But by putting the diverging lens in between the object and my primary lens, my primary converging lens, I'm able to get an image to come into focus on the screen. Again, so without, it's not in focus. And then with, I get an image that is in focus. And I'm able to change the overall focal length of this system by using a diverging lens.